with information today. So edibles, that's herbs, vegetables, uh, vines, brambles, shrubs, and of course, uh, a vegetable. So we'll cover all that stuff. That's today's class. So there was one class member that has a question. Go. Uh, I, I wanted a little area in my yard for a cactus garden of different types. Yeah. And uh, something came in and ate it. I don't know why. Uh, something came in and ate his cactus. So that would be one thing, and only one thing. Havelina. Uh, Havelina came, they love prickly pears and stuff. So, And that's this guy right here, they love this. Since you set the stage, prickly pears, we don't grow a lot of cactus up here. But we do grow lots of prickly pear. They're the only cacti that actually has antifreeze in it enough to get through a cold winter. So this will go down to minus 20 or 30 degrees, some crazy cold. Whereas all other cactus, they go down to 40 degrees, 30 degrees, and they're dying. They're liquefying, they're turning black and melting over. And I brought this one to the edible landscape just because you got to cover prickly pear and the fruits. They'll harvest those and make jams, jellies, all kinds of stuff out of it. It's quite good. It's uniquely southwestern. But that, it's made off of this particular one. You just take some tongs and harvest them, and there's a trick to it, but that's an edible. Uh, that you can go with. Today's class, what we're going to go over is frost dates, harvest. We actually have three different planting dates that we deal with. I'm going to give all those to you. I've got a handout of when do you plant each thing, a calendar that's for here. It's not something downloaded on Google. It's, it's made for here. I'm going to email that to you uh, by the end of the day. Also, uh, we had a class two or three weeks ago from a local chef, and she had the best pesto recipe you've ever tasted. It's so good. I've got herbs, herbs, what to do with them, and then she's got her recipe on it. So I'll give you those two things just to the class here. You showed up, you can have, I'll email that to you is how I'm gonna get it to you, okay? So I've got a list here, thank you. Um, send me the e send me, give me your email list and Ken will have that to you shortly. Um, just two, two sheets. And they'll look like this. And those of you tuned in online, we'll try to get that to you as well. So we appreciate you checking out our Facebook page. Um, this calendar date looks like that. Just goes, when do you plant things? Um, and then this is one that uh, Deb Manderville gave at the last class. And her pesto recipe is, is really, really good. It's not just normal, it's really good. So anyway, she's a big herb nut. Um, okay. So frost dates, let's just get that out of the way. Okay, so you gotta know your frost dates if you're talking edibles. You gotta know when the last frost is, when the first frost is, okay? We might as well cover zones while we're at that. We are a zone seven. That's our official zone. Halden to Cordes Junction. Maybe your 7B, maybe your 7A, maybe your 6B, it doesn't matter. We're all basically, you need plants and go down to about 10, five degrees, some more than that. Just to zero every once in a while. That's our zone. The way the zones work, the higher the number, the warmer the plant likes it. So zone 9, 10, those are Phoenix. They don't like anything about cold. The, the lower the number, the lower the temperature it can go to. So you get zone like 4 or 5, that's Flagstaff. It can go down minus 20, no problem. So you want plants that can grow zone 7 or lower. You don't want to plant plants that are higher in number here unless you're going to treat them like an annual. Just enjoy them for the, while it's hot, and then they're going to melt in the winter, and you go, oh, that was nice. I'm just going to move on, okay? So they're going to die in the winter is what that is. Okay, so zone seven, you can also grow zone six, five, four, three, two, one. But not a zone. We flirt. I've got a couple plants that are zone eight, kind of microclimate, so on a patio, reflective heat, it's in a pot. I'm, I'm playing with zone eights to see where the limits are. I'm a gardener. I like to test where, how far I can go. Where are the boundaries? Don't tell me I can't grow that. I'll prove you wrong. I'm one of those. And so sometimes I succeed and sometimes I don't. But it's fun just to try. Yes? We're in the Verde Valley. What would our zone eight? Verde's going to be a zone eight. You're, you're just a quick warmer. So you need plants to go down to 10, 15 degrees. You definitely get frost. And it'll fool you in the Verde. If you're by the river, all that cold air kind of settles right down on top of you, and you're really, you're a zone seven, just like the rest of us. But if you're on that north, that uh, uh, south-facing or east-facing slope up towards Jerome, 
you get that early morning sun, it's warmer, zone eight. So it just depends. You have more microclimates down the Verde than you do even up here on, on this side of the hill. We're basically all pretty much the same, so close, okay? Our, our frost dates, um, May, is our last frost of the year. This is 100 years of data. We've been tracking this for 100 years now. The average is it lands on, on May 8th. The locals use Mother's Day yeah. as, the, as the kind of the, the date. Um, don't let that fool you. Non-gardeners go, I can't plant until May 8th. They drive me crazy, these non-gardeners. I plant starting in, in February, March. My cool season thing. And that'll be on that calendar, that date that I gave you. You start your spinach, your lettuce, your broccoli, your cauliflower very early because those things will bolt as it gets warm and the flavor gets lost. It's not as sweet. You'll get this bitter tinge to it. So it's better not to wait till May 8th to plant the leafy things. Things where you're harvesting the stems, the flower heads, the, uh, the leaves, those things are better planted early. So March, we really start Planting potatoes and rhubarbs and asparagus and all the leafy things. And then by May 8th, that's when the summer crops go in. Those are things we're harvesting right now. Things that form a fruit, typically. Those are summer plants. They don't like anything about our spring. They want to be warm. They don't want to be cold. They don't even like it below 40, 45 degrees. They want the soil to be warm, the nighttime to be warm. They want everything about summer. Those are tomatoes, cucumbers, eggplants. Oh, they, they want to wait till it's super hot before they're happy. Pumpkins, all the things that were the formula of fruit, those are May 8th, wait. And you will be so tempted to plant early. If you're new to the area, you know how nice the end of March, April can be. You're going, oh, there's no way it can frost. And then it does. That one last freak storm kind of comes and gets it. So the, uh, uh, First frost of the year is October 29th. We generally use Halloween yeah. as, as the holiday. Uh, last year's a little later, it was second week in November. But again, this is a hundred years average. I've seen it snow in the middle of October. It just varies, but the average date, be on your guard by the middle of October. Be aware that maybe I might have to pick those last few tomatoes or cucumbers or or whatever it is out in the garden because it might freeze. Just just watch the weatherman, he'll tell you. But last year was middle of November, last couple of years it's been November. But 100 years of data means it's never on October 29th. 50 of those years is the middle of October. The other 50 years is the middle of, of November. So, but the average is right here. So just, you need to know those dates just so your, your, your guard is up, okay? So, um, I, we're coming into the next planting season. You can start planting in September your leafy things again. So I'm famous for fresh broccoli for Christmas. I just, there's something about that and it tastes so good. Fresh out of the garden, you're having guests over, family, and you're harvesting, still harvesting, even after you've had your first snow, that's magical. But those things like the cold. They like the flavor comes out when it's bitter cold at night bright and sunny during the day. There's this whole, whole nother planting season, which is unique to the Southwest. It's unique to here, where the weather's more temperate. It's cold, but it's not bitter cold. Okay, so we're coming into that. Um, we'll also cover in this class herbs. We grow better herbs. I'll go over some of my favorites. Um, we'll go over trees, because you have to. The harvest is so great on trees this year. We'll, we'll mention them, we'll, we'll, well, this is more of a cursory glance over everything, and then we'll take some questions. So that's what I want to cover, trees, shrubs, vegetables, we're covering that, some of the dates and stuff, and how to, what to watch for. Uh, how to keep it organic, but watch for insects. They're, they're thick right now. Everything is growing so fast, not just the plants. It's the plant disease, the plant insects, everything is growing fast right now. And we've got another two months where we're just growing, we are just harvesting like crazy. So, okay, how are we doing, you okay? Some of the key things, this, this is again, the handouts. I see a lot of note taking. You'll have a handout that'll supplement that, it'll kind of help you. If you miss something, you'll have it later. Okay, probably Monday or Tuesday.
that sound about right? Poor Wednesday. <laughs> as long as I don't have to follow up. <laughs> okay, let's cover, let's just cover trees, get out of the way, because the harvest is so crazy. And what I did is, I have fresh plums for anyone that wants some. They came off my own trees, and they're melting in your mouth. They are a little bit small. I wish they were a little bit bigger, but I did thin them. I should have thinned, especially pitted fruits. Um, pitted fruits, anything that has a, has a seed in it, they really need to be thin here. What happens is they produce so many flowers and so many fruits that the energy coming up from the roots go up and they're trying to keep everything alive all at once because they can't put all, uh, too much energy into one. This should actually be about this big, not this big. If I had thinned these off, and all that energy could be going into the, I would say over half of the fruits should be thinned. That is usually I'll wait until you see the fruit forming, and they go, oh, I'll pick off the weaklings. Anything that doesn't look like it's as healthy as its brother or sister, I go, you're out. And I'm looking to be aggressive. I want to shake the tree, shake the branch. I want to see fruit falling on the ground so that all the remaining fruit, all the energy can go to the remaining fruit. That would be especially important for apricots, nectarines, plums, your pitted fruits. And I would go so far as to say apples and pears. They're going to really benefit from that too, because apples, they'll put five, six fruits on one cluster. I'll pick all those off. I'll pick the weakest fruits until I only have two on each cluster. And that way I'm ensured to have an apple that's big, not, not small. Okay. So that makes sense, but hey, they melt in your mouth. They're so good. They're almost like huge cherries. They're so good. This one's for me. Those are for you. Um, I would say with your fruit trees, in order of success, apples and pears are the most fruitful most years because they're, they're blooming later in spring. They're the last fruit tree to wake up. So those are the ones, if you're, if you're just starting out an orchard, you're just going to have a few trees which one should I go with? Don't go with apricots and nectarines. They're the least likely to fruit. Those are feast or famine kind of plants. You either have so many apricots, you don't know what to do with them all. You better make sure canning supplies and that dryer is ready to go, or you've got nothing. Same to nectarines. So they're, they're the very first ones to bloom in spring. They're usually tricked into waking up early, into March, April, and they're exposed a whole four or five weeks to possible frost. So those are the ones that, so it's always starts, uh, the first ones to wake up are, are apricots and nectarines, then it would be plums, then it would be cherries and peaches, and then it would be apples and, and, and pears. That's the sequence, but how they fruit. And then what we focus on here at Waters Gardens, and what we're famous for, is we're bringing in trees that are a fruiting age. So typically fruit trees need to be about seven years old before they're old enough to fruit. So they're much older trees. And then we're bringing in fruits, we're curating all the varieties so that we only have varieties that we're bringing in the peaches that bloom as late as possible. So they need at least a thousand chilling hours before they wake up, chilling hours. So we get tripped, so many, so many nurseries here, it drives me nuts. They bring in the desert varieties. They're made for Phoenix. They're not made for up here. And so you have this beautiful plum, beautiful apricot beautiful pear, peach, whatever it is, and the tree will grow just fine, but it won't fruit. It's made to fruit down there, not up here. So it's a big mistake factor I find folks make because they went down to Home Dumpo, got their whip. It took five years for it to finally get old enough to, to fruit, and then it doesn't ever fruit because it never it was never meant to fruit up here. It's meant to fruit down there. So really do your homework on the fruit trees. You really want to know. Check with experts, check with neighbors, check, do the, do the internet, do the books, check or just come talk to us. But that's what we're trying to do here is we're bringing in an older fruit. We figure our customers are not coming here. They want to pay a little bit more and get a lot more tree. That's what they're coming for. So we try to deliver an older tree that's mature and then one that fruits as late as possible. Out of all of the apricots, we're bringing in the harcots and the Chinese apricots because those take 850 to 1,000 hours. They're the very last apricot to bloom out of all the apricots. So they're much more likely to produce for you. That's, that's kind of what we're doing. So that's, I think it's enough said about fruit trees. 
just look look for that. We can go into pruning and fertilizing, spraying, all kinds of stuff. I've got a whole class on nothing but fruit trees in spring, early spring. Right now, this is more cursory. Okay. Before I leave it, move on. Anything else on fruit trees? You okay? Yes. Um, when do you start getting in your fruit trees for planting next year? Yes. So when do we start getting in fruit trees? We have fruit trees show up uh, year round. So I just had new fruit trees show up. So this cherry tree right here, cherry tree just came in. So you can plant any time. Now specifically, when do we load up for the spring planting season? I just put in a huge order, about, I don't know how many hundreds of trees. They'll ship February 15th through March, first part of March. Kind of depends on the weather. We'll look at that going, ah, it looks like we've broken. It looks like spring, fall, spring will be here. Ship them. And so we'll start, so we'll start stocking up then. And then would you want to plant after the last crop? Oh, no. Fruit trees, you do want to plant before they wake up. So that's ideal because there's just no chance of a transplant shot. But you put them in the ground. They went to sleep last fall. They go in the ground. They wake up. They go, where am I at? What's going on? Oh, well, let's just grow here. That's kind of how they work. But you can plant them right now, even with foliage, even with fruit on this uh, apple tree. I brought it just because, look, it's got fruit. I knew that would excite you all. That's great. It'll actually produce apples. But you can plant that right now. It's just you're, you've got to be more of a gardener. You all, I would say, no worries whatsoever, because you're obviously, you're in an edible class. It says something about you. But a novice maybe would be better in the, in the early spring before it wakes up. So that's how you do it. You get the most choices of fruit trees specifically, usually by April through May, you get the most choices because we're fully stocked and there's this tidal wave of customers all wanting fruit trees. And they're starting to see everything blossom. There's something inspirational about a tree in full bloom, starting to set fruit. There's something about that that gets people wanting to plant more. This is an exceptionally good fruit year. I've been the judge at the county fair where I had nothing to judge. There was no fruit on the Verde side or this side. There was no fruit in Yavapai County. And it's just boring judging pumpkins. I mean, you can only judge so many onions. This is not very fun. You want, you want grapes and apples and cherries. You want clusters of fruits. And so it just that, that year just happened to be that way. Okay, you all set? I guess the one last parting comment would be, if you're planting fruit trees, make sure they grow straight. I've seen more damage this year where trees are falling out of the ground. The fruit production has been so heavy. If they started, if they weren't staked early on, they start to lean to that northeast. And so they load up with fruit and they just fall over. So that's one to watch. Make sure they grow straight. There's a prevailing southwest wind that, that blows every spring. It gets those trees to lean to the northeast. So kind of watch that one. Is there any sort of like other than Oh, uh, so support for newer trees. Um, usually we're using lodge poles. If we come out and plant for you, if it's a tree, we're automatically going to put two lodge poles. Sometimes they're way bigger than the trees. Yeah. But they're sturdy enough not to wiggle out of the ground. If you use a one inch stake, it'll tend to wiggle out of the ground. But a lodge pole won't. We'll just tie it once. We want it to blow. We want it to, to move in the wind. Right. But we want it to get strong. We just don't want it to lean. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's our goal. After one year, typically you can take that stake off and it's trained to grow straight. If you're on a ridge line or someplace that's real where it funnels, that wind funnels through, maybe you'll keep it on for another another year. But eventually you want it off those stakes as soon as you can. As soon as it's able to grow straight by itself, you want it off those stakes. How much how much give do you want to give it? Like when you tie it, like anything. How much give on stakes? Yeah. A lot of give. Oh, okay. It can blow right to the ground if you want. Oh, okay. As long as it stakes bring it right back okay, up. Okay. okay, a lot of folks will go, do I need three stakes or two stakes or one stakes? Two stakes is fine. Yeah. Do I go to the northeast, southwest, north? It doesn't matter. Don't overthink it. Just put stakes on it, tie it once. For a really big tree, maybe we'll tie it twice, and then we we'll call it all good. Keep it on for a year, and then we're done. A tree this size, this is a persimmon. You folks from the Southern California will love this, so I brought it just for you. Uh, for that big, sweet, juicy we persimmons, they're like, the sweetest fruit you could ever, ever bite into, and then it has this aftermath of like, whoa, lemons. <laughs> so it's got this sweet, sour feng shui thing that's got going. But persimmons, that's a tree that size, 
Just take it just one year, let it get rooted, and it's good to go. Okay, but trees are like parachutes. Leaf out and have this huge canopy. Just catches the wind and gets them to lean over. So kind of watch that one. Enough about fruit trees. Let's move on, okay, shall we? So, she, so what causes leaf, holes in the leaves? Depends on the, on the tree. Um, some of the pitted fruits, cool strawberry. Vincent also loves strawberries. If you ever see the strawberries kind of rummaged over and everything's laying down, he's been in picking the strawberries. He knows where they're at, he knows what they taste like, he loves them. Um, uh, like pitted fruits, we've got something called shot hole. Looks like someone took a shotgun and shot a shotgun through it. it looks like little holes. This little bacteria thing that eats, eats a little hole out of it. Sometimes grasshoppers, you folks in Chino Valley. I think you're in the center of the grasshopper <laughs> world. Uh, the ground is moving out there right now. Uh, they can sometimes eat it, just depends. I'll show you a spray afterwards that can kind of keep it organic and kind of keep it all in check. Uh, my strawberry patch is loaded right now. It's a big patch, about, about this big. I just planted a few of these in, but the way strawberries work, um, they start to grow, they start to put a run around, touch, and they start to root, and then they keep running like this. They just jump around. They're actually difficult to keep reined in. So you kind of want to, there's a little bit of maintenance with them if you want to bed. But you're going to want to grow out of their bounds. So just realize that's how they're going to grow. They grow really well in containers. In fact, I think you should use this more for container plants. You can contain them easily, and they look pretty, they run, they're green most of the year. But you don't think of edibles as, as a container plant. You just think flowers. This has got everything you want. Green, it's flowers, it's fruits, pretty. Um, this one I have in my in a lower basin below my pond. If the pond overflows, I rain harvest off the roof, fill the pond. If it overflows, it goes down to this lower retention pond. I put these there. And they're in heaven. They just are in heaven. So is Vincent. He goes from <laughs> rummages around going, where are they? Where are they? And sometimes I get some left. There's nothing better than fruits and vegetables picked warm from the sun right off the plant melts in your mouth i was cooking last night on the uh, on the grill picking tomatoes and basil and just popping them in i almost wasn't hungry by the time i got done with the grill it's so nice having this time of year that's what it's about it's healthier for you too you know where they're coming from they have not been sprayed a lot of times they'll put these fruits into a container and they'll fumigate it before it comes in. You don't even know that. They don't even tell you that, but it's organic. You know where it's coming from when it's your, from your own backyard. And that's what I like about it. The strawberries are great ground cover. Um, I think we need to think of this more because it's so happy up here. And you don't have to put straw over them or treat them with any care like you do in the Midwest. You just plant them and they just produce. I'll go through with a weed whacker, a mower or something, whack them off in the spring, fertilize them, but that's, that's about all I do. Okay, really good producer. Um, kale, I've got a lot of, this is Russian red, edible kale. Uh, this one I've got some kale that are like two, three years old. I planted it two years ago in the fall. I harvested kale all, all spring, all winter long, all spring long. It took a little break in the summer, and by fall it was going again, but all your leafy materials, some of these are perennial. We sell them as annuals, but they seem to live I kind of call them biannuals. I get a couple of years out of them, and finally they start to look mangy. If you don't look pretty and edible, you're not welcome in my garden. I want it to look good, and I want it to taste good. So about two years, and then it starts to, it's time for a replacement. So I've got some kale, quite a few kales that are going strong still. Um, right now, I think you could start, even by seed, it's very inexpensive by seed, because you're right on that cusp. September is like, well, it is September, isn't it? Yeah. It just happened. <laughs> it is September, there, you can start now. Anytime in September, you could probably start by seed. All your leafy things, lettuce, kale. I've got plants too, but you can get more out of the seed for a couple, you know, a couple bucks, you can get a whole bunch of seeds. So uh, get all the leafy stuff, le spinach, le uh, lettuce, all the fancy lettuce, like the red lettuce, so high in antioxidants, you can't get that at the store. If you can, it's like five bucks a head. It's crazy. It grows like a weed in the garden. You can do that by seed right now. Yeah. So the weed ones, you have to worry about seed crowding? Where you, yeah, seed crowding. There is some of that. Okay. You do want to kind of space it. Okay. There's a technique to that. All right. 
Or you can just let them grow, and then there's this whole trend right now of seedlings. Uh, it's, there's a whole uh, a movement of sprouts. sunflower sprouts. Yeah, let sprout, the sprout things are much higher in, in nutrition. So you could like start it, thin them, eat them, yeah. mm -hmm. okay. and then kind of go that way. Or you just try to space it as best you can. Go, yeah, it looks about right. And then hand <coughs> thin them as you go. There's a technique to that. That's just gardening you learn by, you learn by doing. That's the only way you learn that, is by doing, yeah. What about beets? Beets, you can start now, turnips, all the, all the root crops, uh, absolutely. Uh, broccoli, cauliflower, anything you're harvesting, either the flower head, the stems, or the leaves, you can start right now. And you'll be harvesting that right through the end of the year. Maybe even, depending on the winter, through the winter. But definitely through Christmas, you'll be harvesting uh, edibles. Yeah? Is there any of these leafy vegetables that I have to not? Oh. <laughs> okay, rabbits. <laughs> Are there any leafy things? Are you kidding me? If you like it, so do rabbits. You need a shotgun, a crock pot, and some barbecue sauce. That's what you need. I don't know. <laughs> or a fence. Maybe field fence might be more humane. Lisa does not like it when I bring my hunter outdoorsman out. So uh, <laughs> probably fence them out. I have seen, you need to be smaller than two inch. I've seen a full grown rabbit at full speed with a dog behind its tail go right through a chain link fence like it was nothing. It was spooked. It was scared. So it that head got through and it went right through. Much less, the real, the real, my nemesis is a pack rats. That's my big thing. Pack rats, it's, it's a rat on steroids. It's like, it's like a squirrel size, like a small cat. It's like, it's like, it's a big, big rat. Um, and it likes fruit. Because it's coming in for the neighbor's apricots and my pumpkins. My voles are another one, little, little tiny mice. So there I just have traps out. I've got a trap line. I've just got three, three. In the backyard where the dogs are, I've got three rat traps. And I bait them with peanuts, peanut butter, nuts. They like nuts. And I just check it every week and I'll catch something every week in there, in there because they're in harvesting the fruits that weren't cleaned up. They're in my yard. They love my hot tub, my built-in grill. They love the furniture pads. It's irritating. You do that to my yard, you, you're in doom you and all your kin so you just have a trap line probably something like that watch that squirrels would be another one to watch ground squirrels just know where their hole is and fumigate them or do something don't let them live so that they deserve to be elsewhere heaven bound okay so we grow better herbs than anywhere else i think better than the midwest which is famous way better than the south even even the southern california we grow really nice herbs because it's bright days, cool nights, and it's dry most of the time. So we don't get a lot of mildew, the spotting, some of the meltdowns, some of the black uh, issue, uh, leaf spots that, that other parts of the country are famous for. Uh, I'm noticing on my, one, one thing I've noticed on my rosemary, I'm seeing a little bit of spittle bug. It's white, gooey stuff on the stems. Super easy to kill, and we'll show you how to do that. Just something to watch in your own garden. It's showing up in my yard, I'm showing, show, it's showing up everywhere. Something I look for, and if there's an organic spray you could hit them with, it wipes them right out. That's the only real thing. Animals do not eat herbs. Rats, uh, deer, rabbits, they don't like herbs. You would think they would, but even parsley they don't like. They leave it alone. So you can plant those right out in the forested areas and keep it exposed. I grow them in containers. I grow them in my best container. One that gets the most comments. It's got figs growing up, loaded with figs right now, multi-stem, and I've got creeping thyme that just overflows this beautiful cobalt blue pot. It looks Mediterranean. It was meant to look artistic. It's beautiful and it's edible. And whenever I need thyme out in the, on the grill or whatever, I just snip them off, use it right in there. It's a good way to go. So you can use them wherever, raised beds, containers, they grow really, really well, and most of them are perennial. Remember, perennial and permanent both start with P, so they're forever. Annuals are just one season, they're done. So think perennial and, and permanent. Um, some examples, this is one of the only ones that's not, this and basil are the two that are annuals, although they can reseed quite well. Although in the verde, this would be a perennial. 
least in, in uh, I've got friends in Skull Valley that's got a huge bed of cilantro or coriander. Coriander, you harvest the seed, it's coriander. If you harvest the, the foliage, it's cilantro. Okay, so that's the difference. It does really, really well here. It's a summer, summer plant though. Um, I do use a lot of oregano as a ground cover. And it's, I like the golden, golden oregano. I use this one a lot just because it's bright and cheery. And so I use it in containers or by the walkway. Come up to the front door, just says he greets you and goes, please step on me so I can fill the whole air up with, with this beautiful oregano fragrance. Oh man, nothing better. Sage, we're coming up to Thanksgiving where we're using a lot of sage in the fall for dinners. Great for turkeys and chickens and all kinds of sauces. But this is a perennial. My, my sage is five years old. This tall, it's beautiful. I have the traditional blue one that's, that's normal. I brought this one because it's different. Just variegated, same herbal scent. Here, take that and just, is it gonna go? <laughs> just smell that, isn't that wonderful? Pass it around. Oh, my staff is gonna shoot you. There we go. <laughs> Chives and onions do really, really well here. And it's a cool season thing. You'll harvest this. Right now they're bolting. It's hard to keep them from bolting. You plant them a little later and they're just, there's none of that issue. So chives are great. This is one you plant, you harvest the, the foliage and uh, it'll just grow for years and years and years. This one again, I think we can think outside the box. We aren't right off the farm anymore. We don't have to compare ourselves to grandpa. We're not, we don't have to line up tomatoes all in a row. They gotta be in their space and not, we can actually grow them out as landscape featured plants. We can put them front and center. We can spray paint the tomato cage red or yellow or whatever color we want, make art out of it and grow tomatoes through it. Or, and it's, it's an art form now, right there at the front door. People commented on that, it's such an, a novel thing, but I think we can think, this, is, this would look great with pansies growing up, up or violas or petunias. It could be beautiful just right there at the front on the deck. This one I grow, I don't know what to do with it. It's fennel. I grow it for my monarchs. My, my monarch butterflies love fennel. I don't like fennel. I don't want to eat fennel. Please don't invite me over for fennel. I don't know what to do with the root. I don't know what to do with the foliage. It's just pretty. It grows about this tall, and my monarchs love it. That's good enough for me, so it's in my herb garden. But you can grow fennel, too. If you know what to do with fennel, if you're from the old country, just go for it. Love it. That, that's good stuff. Um, lettuce right now, um, you, you plant this one plant and within a week you'll be harvesting so much lettuce very, very quickly. But again, I think you could start this by seed. I've got it any form you need and all of our seed are organic, non-GMO, all of our plants are that way. Uh, but you could plant that right now. And I would say, I would encourage you, plant the varieties you just can't find anywhere else. They're healthier for you. So many of these vegetables are, are made for shipping. They're made for longevity, for shelf life. They are not made. The best varieties, I think, are ones you have to grow in your backyard because they just don't ship, they, they bruise too easy, or they just they rot too fast. But right from the garden, I think they taste better and they're healthier for you. Personal opinion. I also know that's the case because uh, I talk with farmers that grow them. Um, rosemary. I have a lot of rosemary. I grow it as an ornamental plant. Just a nice evergreen, drought hardy, sun loving, takes brutal, I mean, just kick dirt at it, talk dirty to it. It likes that. So rosemary does really well. They've got two varieties, uh, an upright variety, shrub, or they've got a creeping variety. One that only gets about, oh, knee higher, so it just kind of runs this way. So the runner does take a little bit of maintenance. The run, it wants to run outside its bounds. So give it some space or just be willing to Go, that's far enough. Let me just prune that off and throw it away and start over. It wants to run. So my, my creeping rosemary planted like this is now, I don't know, six by six or more. And I just had to trim it back on your now over, you've reached your limits, no more. So I pruned it back a little bit, just recently. The rosemary does really, really well. Again, look for, just on my own, I just spotted it. It's got a little bit of white, it looks like someone took a loogie or spit on it or something. It's kind of gross looking, it's sticky, gooey. Look for that, that spittle bug. Spittle bug. Um, can do, it's just easy to sprout. I'll show you what to do with that. 
Uh, bay laurel, evergreen shrub. I think it's perennial at the lower elevations, 4,000 foot and lower, perennial. I've grown it in Skull Valley, perennial. Up here, I get a couple years out of it, and then finally a, a winter will take it and just collapses and dies. So it's kind of an annual up here, biannual, but it's pretty. There's nothing better than fresh bay leaf. Oh man, it smells good. Okay, are we done with herbs? I think I got it. Let's go down to the vines and grapes. Let's just combine those two. We're in very good grape country. Uh, we're finding it's even better. Uh, here, we, we're turning into a little mini Napa Valley. You can call it that. In our pride, I guess we can. But we're growing really nice grapes. The alkalinity does something to flavor. It brings the flavor out. So we're doing vintner or, or you know, wine grapes, or we do table grapes. They do very, very well here. Production's very heavy. My grapes right now are little clusters about this big. Another two, three weeks, I'll probably be harvesting so many grapes. I'll eat them until I'm just sick. I can't eat anymore. So I love taking my grandkids out. We just sit there and we just eat grapes. There's something magical about grandparents with edibles. They think you're like a superhero or something. I should put a big S in my chest or something. You should be out there in our blue underwear just eating grapes. It's, they, they think you're the greatest thing ever. And so grapes do really well. Give them something to climb up. They do very well. I grow mine on a fence. We've got a six foot cedar fence. It's kind of kind of sterile. Felt too utilitarian. I want it to feel more garden-esque or private garden. So I just put every eight foot center. I put, I grow something. I grow uh, brambles or grapes. This happens to be uh, Niagara grapes. Just train that to grow up and away you go. It's already six foot tall in the ground. So this one is a blackberry. Or no, this is a Marionberry. Marionberry blackberry. If you're from Oregon, it's a Marionberry. If you're here, it's blackberry. It's a specific variety of blackberry. Um, I've had so many blackberries, I mean bowls of blackberries. Fresh for dessert dinner. There's, it's that heavy. So you can grow raspberries here, blackberries, ra uh, gold raspberries, marion berries, they all do really well. Give them some space. My blackberries are every bit of this big. They're head high and wide, okay? But they do very, very well. In the ground, I would say in the ground for those are gonna do better or a really big pot. So I'm growing hops right now, just for fun. Since I haven't grown it before, I've got a uh, two-story from the from the patio up to the deck and then beyond. It's about two-story highs, probably 20 feet up. It's a pretty 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 good climb. I'm growing hops in the big pot up the post, up the railing. It has made the railing now. It's starting to go across the railing in the upper deck, and it does. It's full of hops right now. I probably pull it out of the ground this year because I'm tired of it. I just got some spider mites. And I uh, tried it. It worked. What's next? It's just fun. It's fun to garden and try things. It's been there for three years, just kind of starting over. Blueberries do grow here, and they will produce a lot of blueberries. Okay, I would say if you're a novice just getting started here, start with some of the others first. These are a little bit more difficult to grow. Some personal experience. Again, my name's Ken. I'm your friend. We just lean over the fence and we're talking as neighbors. Just here's what's worked. That's the, that's, the, that's the mindset. I tried to grow this in the ground. The alkalinity was just too much. It turned yellow, and I, I couldn't get it to stay green and produce big, 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 big fruits. I put it in a container where I can control the soil. It was mainly potting soil, peat moss-based potting soil. All of a sudden, peat moss is very acidic. The drainage is better, and I got better production. It stayed green. It was much easier to grow. So if you're going to grow a blueberry, the suggestion I would have would be probably grow in a raised bed or, or container or someplace where you can actually control the soil that it's in, and I think you'll have better luck. Okay. It's a pretty plant no matter what. The, the fruits are almost a bonus. So they melt in your mouth. They're so much better than in the store. Better ripe fruit off the vine, off the, off the bush, off the tree, off, so much better. That last few days, last week, of ripening on the plant changes the flavor. Increasing the sugar is tr dramatic how much difference it is. Any other questions? You doing okay? Yes. You're full of it back there. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> do 
I'm not a, a local and part-time resident. Okay. Do they, can you winter them over? Yeah, the all these will winter right in the container right outside. Yeah, all, everything except, so far, everything except this will winter right over. Perennial, year after year. Yep. Cilantro recede. The true definition of a perennial is it will come back from the same root as before. So I do get basil, I get tomatoes coming up in the yard. Just things are happy growing in my yard, so they just kind of come up. Not on time, not where I want, not when I want, but they come up. So anyway. Um, why don't we go over some issues to kind of watch? Just because edibles, if you're not careful, everything's one gonna want to eat your stuff, not just you. You gotta want to control that. Uh, fruits, they make a tape inside, very inexpensive, like four or five bucks. It's uh, bird, bird tape, scare tape. It's got several names, but basically I tie it up on my peaches, on my plums, on my trees, and uh, it just flitters and it scares the birds off. Otherwise, you know what birds will do? They'll pick a hole in every single fruit. They won't eat one fruit. They'll pick every single fruit before they get, before it starts to rot and you don't get the shelf life. The secret with the tape is it works really, really well. Uh, you got to put it up about a week prior to the fruit actually harvesting. Don't put it up too early, but they get used to it. That's one thing is school of hard knocks. I've kind of tried. Um, and then don't put one strip and expect the whole tree to be protected. You got to put them about every 18, 24 inches or so. There's got to be a lot of it. So you're not going to buy a, probably a, a roll per tree or per couple of trees. Um, also, another little secret, I'm using it on my blackberries right now. So blackberries, the way they work, raspberries the same way. You, one cane will have all the fruit on it. I'm putting the scare tape on that one, marking it as a marker, when that's the one I want to prune out this winter. So I use it as, as a marking and it also keeps the birds off. It's just my way of saying which ones are pruned. The way the uh, brambles work, it's producing big long canes right now with no fruit on it. That's the cane that will produce fruit next year. So you want to prune out the one that had fruit on it this year. So again, it's the, most of your berries are, are producing fruit on second year wood. So that's as far as I can go into it. I got a whole class on just that. But just again, my name's Ken. I'm your friend. We're just talking real quick over the fence. Here's what I'm doing right now in my own garden. Just help, help me memorize what, which one is it? Because in January, you'll be going, I'm out pruning, going, which one was it? And you can't remember. The one with a little bit of flagging tape on it, you know. So Mark, some people use string, some use, I'm just going, I want to keep the birds off my berries anyway. Well, that's this one, that's it. Um, some insects to watch. The spittle bug. There's two organics I always have in the garden. One is called Home Harvest. This one we put together years ago. Um, actually when the economy tanked about 10 years ago, uh, producers actually started to cheapen the product. They made smaller containers, they diluted a lot of products, and they diluted my neem oil. I got all ticked off about it. I said, that's it, I'm making my own. I'm going to put this in my bottle. So this is a fully concentrated neem. It, you, organic gardeners are N-E-E-M. It's, it's a fancy organic. Uh, you spritz that uh, spittle bug. Uh, thrip, aphids, whatever it is, smaller insects, highly, highly effective. And you can spray it up to the day of harvest. So it's completely organic. Again, it's a fancy plant oil. Uh, also has a slight scent to it. You'll smell it when you spray it on there. Um, it has a repelling action to, let's say, white flies, these other, other things. You kinda, they'll smell it and go, Ew. let's go over to the neighbors and eat their stuff. It really tastes better. So that's, that's kind of my first line of defense. Also highly effective on leaf spot and mildew, powdery mildew. What it does, it coats the spore and doesn't let it spread, as long as you catch it early. If you let it go and the whole pumpkin is completely white, not so effective, we need to upgrade to something stronger. If you catch it early, highly effective. That's my first line of defense. And then for trees, things that are big, this is basically neem oil. It's called triple action. You folks can see that on Facebook, it's a triple action. This one is uh, neem oil, but they've also put uh, uh, permethrin in it, which is crushed up mums, basically. 
So now you get a contact kill and you get the neem oil, you get a kind of a double benefit. This is super concentrated, so now you can afford to put it into a hose in spray or hose down the peach tree or the whatever you, whatever you need. If you need quantity, this is the way to go. And those are the two organics. Then we get into whey specialized. So someone had mentioned snails and slugs and something. I do see quite a few snails in my own garden. They show up in the, when the monsoons hit, that's when they go crazy. One snail can lay a thousand eggs, just like that. So they spread very, very quickly. So for myself, I used, uh, I forget the name of the label on the product, but it's iron sulfate. Any of our products down there are for snail and slugs are organic. Diatomaceous earth is another one. Diatomaceous earth is good. I just don't find it as effective in the rainy season. It gets washed underneath the soil and doesn't work as well. Sometimes, and it's kind of ugly. It's white powder all over the place, it's messy. It's just, um, I feel like I gotta hose myself down every time I use it. Very safe, it's fossilized crustaceans. Cuts the belly open of, of earwigs, uh, uh, pill bugs, all these things that crawl on the ground. Very, very effective. Not so effective on grasshoppers. Things that have legs that kind of move around, not so effective. Things that crawl around, more effective. What it does is it scrapes their belly open and they dehydrate. They basically just dehydrate. That's why it's so effective that way. So think in terms of bugs. That's where the rocks are. The earwigs are coming out at night to eat your fruits. Just put them right there. Okay, question. I just wanted to comment that uh, I did a lot of gardening in Oregon on the coast and I did raised bed gardening. Yeah. And put pea gravel all the way around the, uh, the raised beds. Yeah. They don't like that on their belly. Oh, they, very they good. So she's from Oregon. Them. She used pea gravel around the raised beds to keep insects. I would think that'd be scorpion and centipede bait, but, but I don't know. Not in Oregon. Yeah, not in Oregon, yeah. Here we, I get these big red centipedes, which I like because they're predators. They eat other things. But I have had a friend where it got underneath her leg and her jeans, and it gave her a zipper line all the way up her leg before she get her pants off. Just that was that. They're very poisonous. Their, their, their uh, feet are poisonous. They kind of hooked in. You can just see this scar. So kind of in the right place okay but where the kids are playing you're out shovel in the head and they get huge yeah, they just yeah. get gigantic yeah for the snail how do they affect the plants do they more eat the leaves or do they yeah how do snails and slugs are kind of the same ones with the shell ones without how do they affect the plants really what they'll have is they love leafy things and they'll eat a hole out so if it's a hole out of the herb or vegetable that's more than likely snails or slugs. What I don't see any snails or slugs. They only come out at night because they're bird bait. Birds love them. So they only come out when the birds aren't at bay. So they're really nocturnal or, or rainy days, that kind of stuff. That's when you'll see them. They're always tucked underneath. Like they love my ivy and my uh, uh, five leaf akivia, akivia, the vines. They'll be up underneath there and I just can't find them. So I throw down bait. They come out at night, go, oh, they left me a little snack. Yummy. Dead. <laughs> just kind of think in those terms. So, and they show up in the rainy season. So usually in July, when we get a rain cycle, July, August, September will end at some point. It'll just dry up and we'll be done, just like that. Uh, so that's when they go crazy. That's when the mildew goes crazy. So your powdery mildew, look for white on the, on the leaves. It's dangerous. It gets on your pumpkins, gets on your squash, gets on any roses, whatever. The plant will shut down will stop growing so you want to control that so it just what it is is the spore eating the sugars out of the leaf literally eating the plant alive you can spray that i've got a copper fungicide if it's all white i've got a stronger organic that we can recommend uh, but i would say first and foremost use the home harvest highly effective people. you know it's coming like my pumpkins i know i will get powdery mildew i know it it's going to happen it happens every year in the monsoon I just start spritzing this as a preventative. I'll go out every two, three weeks and just kind of spritz the foliage and call it all good. Okay? Fertilization, uh, use the all purpose plant food. It's a food we put together for here. It's made for the mountains of Arizona. Our water is extremely alkaline. That's going to affect you more than anything else. Your plants will start turning yellow. You'll be going, what the heck? This never happened before. What's going on? It's always the alkalinity. I need iron, more iron. It's not the iron. The iron is there in the ground. We're so rich in iron in our soil, just naturally. 
in the old ironite plant was is just a few miles away. It's not a super fun sight, but it's right there. You can see it. It's poison everything. Uh, we have so much iron in our soil already, the plants just can't get to it. It's locked up because the alkalinity went too high. So it's there, it just can't get to it. You can lower the pH, releases it, and all of a sudden things look green almost immediately. So we know that about our water. Our, your water is the enemy. Every time you water, you get that alkalinity comes from the water. So you're adding that to your soil so it builds up in the soil. So if you know that, you can go ahead and add sulfur. So we front loaded this with a lot of sulfur. So the sulfur lowers the pH. And then with the main ingredient is cottonseed meal. You'll smell that. It kind of has an earthy smell. Some of you ladies like it, some of you don't. My wife doesn't let me use it above the front door. Or I use it in the rainstorm or something. That seems to be good because it gets the smell go away. It's got a kind of cottonseed meal as the main ingredient which is also very acidic. And it's got some bird guano and fairy dust, and everything else in it. But I would use this at least uh, four times a year, especially for edibles. I would use it the holidays would be uh, Easter, spring. I use it the 4th of July, which is right at the very front edge of the monsoon season. I would use it Halloween, the most important feeding of the year, especially for trees and vines, and grapes, that kind of stuff. Fall feeding is the most important. And then for things I'm really trying to juice, uh, grapes, some of my fruit trees, uh, they're budding starting right after, uh, right, right after the new year. You're starting to see buds really swell, I mean big, noticeable. So I fertilize right at the new year. I, at least three times a year to four times. Uh, evergreens seem to like that as well, especially little evergreens, little ponderosa pine, little Austrian pines, little spruce, little, It'll green them up or blue them up. You know, get get that growth, get them up to size faster. Okay, with that, I think I've covered all the topics I wanted to cover. Let's go down the rabbit trail, starting the back. The um, fertilizing that applies to the edible as well as the other wheat. I, I would do everything. I mean, every what happens is you fertilize in spring, uh, right as things are waking up. They're very hungry. You're fertilizing right then, uh, and that'll take you. This will last because it's organic. It takes it'll feed for about three months. Far better than a synthetic fertilizer, like petroleum-based fertilizer, like a Scotch Trip Builder, those kinds of things. Those are usually within 30 days. They're flushed out. And they're going to reapply. So most of that's so water soluble, very little of it's actually picked up by the plant. These are organic, so they're going to break down slowly over about a three-month period of time. So the plant can pick up most of the food, um, so it just lasts longer. You've watered so much through June, though, that most of that food, food's gone, just because we've upped the water to get through the hottest month, the hardest month to grow things, June. It's dry, hot, windy, arid. It's hard to get things to limp through, just limp through June. Because when the monsoons come in July, things go, that's it, I'm just gonna grow. You get this huge, uh, dramatic growth. You can fertilize right at the front edge of that monsoon season. You'll see your grapes will just grow, go crazy. Your figs, your pomegranates, all those things that are summer summer growth, they'll just grow, grow, grow like crazy. And yes? Is uh, rainwater as acidic as the town water? Rainwater or city water or well water. Well water is the worst. The worst uh, pH, the, the worst uh, soil samples I've seen are from wells. Depends on where the straw is put in the ground. City water is also very, very alkalinity. I've seen as high as 8.0, 8.2, mid eights from city water. It depends on which well they're pulling from and when. So they're storing that out and then they're pumping it through to you. Also get some chlorine stuff that happens with cities. Uh, rainwater is the best. You can't beat it. It's neutral. It's the perfect water. If you can get rainwater that's been through an electrical storm, that is the absolute best. Because as the lightning goes through the air, it burns the air, charges it with nitrogen, then it brings it down to a neutral, neutral water. That's the best. That's why the lichen on the rocks and the trees flow like fluorescent green in a rainstorm, because it was nitrogen charged, neutral water. It's just fertilized, just like that. It's like miracle growing. Supercharged. It's like the best. So that's rainwater is always best. Not ideal though. In the back, and we'll come back over here. Well, what, what kind of planning would be the best to put in a well? 
The only way to know with well water, again, I've had agricultural wells, three inch, 95 gallons a minute, I mean, huge wells. Um, the only way to know is to test it, to have a pH. To, and it's mainly gonna be the pH. I can tell you every, every soil test I've ever seen, every one of them, well, I can't say that. There's been a few that had old established gardens that were pretty good. Test the water. Test the water. So water is always high in pH. Just the wells, if you're getting down through some uh, ash layer or old volcanic cinders, the water is going to be high in pH because ash is very high in pH. That's where we have, uh, Thumb Butte was an old volcano core. All the ash that was around that volcano settled and now we're gardening in it. Mm -hmm. So the water is very, very up there, and that's why. Okay, you'll need nitrogen, you'll need phosphorus, yes. We have we kind of touched on this, but we have a question here. Yeah. Uh, pill bug, what's the best for pill bug control? Pill bugs, or, or yep, uh, good question actually. Pill bugs, they come out, and, and a few pill bugs are fine. It's when you get too many of them, they start coming out at night, they start eating your fruits. They love cucumbers, pumpkins, anything that touches the ground, they'll start eating the bottom of that fruit. Strawberries, they love. There, diatomaceous earth is an organic way to, to do that. Uh, I think I've also got a, a bait in there made with spinosa, which is organic. So they'll come out, eat the bait, and eat the spinosa, and kill them. Uh, earwigs, in the same way. They kind of go hand in hand. When earwigs are bad, so are pill bugs. They both do the same thing. So a few, I wouldn't lose my head over just one or two. But where one or two are, and you lift a rock up, and you see hundreds of them, that's a problem. You want to solve that. So thin them out. Come, if you see it, come see us. And we've got we've got experts on bugs. I mean, we, we love, I mean, the team will actually come in. You bring something freaky in. I've seen the whole team rally around and go, oh, I've never seen that before. That's so neat. That's a weird deal. Yeah, it's, there's medication for it. What's that? Oh, what zone are we? We're a zone seven. Zone seven for sure. Oh, no CMs are hard. No CMs are also called THRIP, T-H-R-I-P. They sometimes bite your skin and leave a little welt. They come out mainly in spring, not so much in summer. They're a spring thing. They usually show up about, usually it's aphids and it's no CMs or THRIP. Um, the uh, uh, triple action would be highly effective, or I've got some stronger stuff you want to, if it's not, or if you're not eating it, I try to go organic when it's, I'm eating it. Out the yard, of just my roses, I'm less finicky, but I do care about my health too. So I'm trying to spray organics wherever possible. I would do the triple action, it would be highly effective. Yes? So I noticed you don't have any dill, and for some reason, I have the hardest time growing dill. Yeah. So dill, she's got a hard time growing dill, so do I. I don't know what that is. I think it's sunshine, they love the sun. And I plant mine too early, I think. It doesn't like that cold nights. I think I need to plant a little bit later when it's dry. I think June, I'd wait to plant dill until June. Most people put it in the first part of May. Is and it's just bright. I don't say a lot of water. I think it needs drainage, but moist. So some folks, if you can grow dill, yeah. you're the bomb. You, you, are, you are the gardener, you are it. And I, I, I just, some, some plants I go, too frustrating. I feel so bad about myself. I can't do this anymore. So I switched to something else. Sage. What I did. Or my dill was I put sage in. I'm a hero. I'm like a garden god. But I can't grow dill. Or cilantro. I can't grow this. I just go not worth it. It's, it's just not too frustrating. Parsley? I have so much parsley I don't know what to do with it all. But that's just... And you'll find it's probably my soil where I'm at or the sun that I'm at. It's probably... It's probably environmental. It may not be the gardener, and it may actually be the spot. And there are some spots. I got the Ken's two strikes you're out theory. If you plant something in that hole, like a tree or a shrub, and it died, try it again. But dig it a little bit deeper. Get the, It's a drainage. Something's happening. You've got a caliche layer. You've got a, a rock shelf, a boulder. Something's there that's causing this issue. Try to dig a little deeper, get a chimney is what we call it, dig up the space that's down, get to the next soil bed, try it again. If it dies again, abandon that hole. Don't stop torturing yourself. <laughs> All you gotta do is move five, 10 feet over, and it will start growing over there. Literally, you'll, but one grows here, it won't grow here. Why? It's mountain soils, it's just the way it is. 
It's these bands, the way this soil band goes through your yard, it just affects how your gardens grow. And so the torturous gardeners, they like to keep trying. Because you have gardeners, you don't tell them they can't grow something there. They're going to keep trying. Uh, a little technique I had out in Prescott Valley, I would say the 69 corridor on. Uh, the ranch, Heaven Pike Hills, Prescott Valley, Dewey, Mayor Humboldt, Port of Junction. That's where the heavy clay and caliche layers are. And as you go further out, the thicker and thicker the layers get. A caliche is like a, it's like a gray, it's like concrete through, through the soil. Water will not go through it. The technique I use, it was a game changer out there. What I did, and then I'll leave it with this. Let's pick something, let's pick this uh, apple. What I literally did, right here. I literally left that much of the root out of the ground. And then I mounted the soil up. So everything was on a very, very slight mound. It was, you couldn't see it, but I could. I, I was trying to go at soil level, but then I, I raised it just a bit, mounted it, put the drip emitter on top of that mound, game changer. It ensured that the plants could breathe during the months, the wet cycles. You get a wet cycle in March, you get a wet cycle in July and August. And that's when most of the plants die. It's not June with the heat, it's not January with the cold, it's the, the wet season. Because the soil will not perk, and literally we get root rot. You'll pull that plant out of the ground, and you'll smell an odor, it smells foul. It's literally the roots have rotted off because it stayed too wet. So that's something to kind of watch, especially with the heavy clay soils. Don't need to do that in uh, granite oaks. The closer you get to granite mountain, the more granity. Actually, you all have a, about a foot, foot and a half layer of just crushed granite and then rock, just like this hard pan underneath. It's ridiculous. So you get fooled and thinking it'll, it'll actually drain and it doesn't. Just kind of watch that, okay? That's with any shrub, tree, vine, whatever. Works, works well. One last question, and I'm right on one hour, Lisa's gonna be proud of me. She made me wear my big watch, so I had to see it before, so, yes. Yeah, do uh, fruit vines do best in the sun? How are good question, very, very good. Yeah, so her question was, how much sun do these things need? Most things need six hours or more of sun. That's considered full sun, six hours. It's not all day. Six hours to find at this altitude here, because our sun is more intense. We are closer to heaven. We're up in God's country. And the sun is more intense. And so six hours or more is, is enough to grow any of these. What I do find is that some of my plants, my leafy plants, I will plant more in the shaded areas through, through the heat of summer. So lettuce, uh, uh, broccoli, we'll want to bolt. I've got some broccoli growing now, the head's on it about this big. I've got it in more shaded areas. Whereas if I had it in full sun, it would bolt and go into flower on me. So I'm trying to control, that's gardening. I'm playing, I'm trying to control the environment of these plants so they will perform better for me. But that's kind of unique. If I simply were to plant them in March, full sun, they'd be perfectly happy. But then I would be willing to pull them out, going, okay, I'm done. Now I want my tomatoes there, or my summer plants, you have this crop rotation or square foot gardening or density gardening. There's several names for it. You can have quite a, quite a production. But again, think of things like, like artichokes. It's a beautiful landscape. It's a beautiful plant. I don't think we have to put it in the garden. I think we can put it right out in the landscape and use it as an accent. Pomegranates, figs, a lot of these, a lot of these things we can use as, as decor, decoration and as, as edible both. You can have your cake and eat it too if you're a gardener and willing to play with it. Okay? Y'all have been great. We'll get those handouts to you shortly.